Imagine that we have a 6x12 chessboard. On one end of it, we have a white rook. On the other end of it, we have a black king. This is not a normal game of chess. The king is going to stay stationary. Instead, you and I are going to take turns moving the rook. Furthermore, the rook's moves are restricted. It can only move up or right. As such, every single time you and I make a move, we have to make progress toward that king. The winner of this game is the person that captures the king. Here's the puzzle. You're going first. After that, we will alternate who moves the rook. And no passing is allowed, so every time someone makes a move, they cannot keep the rook in the current square. Your goal is to design a strategy that guarantees you the victory. And while you think about that, check out some of these cool books that I've written. Your hint for today is that this game is a cleverly disguised version of NIM, which is a topic I cover in Chapter 2 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. Are you ready for the solution? If not, here's a hint. Your first move of the game should be to place the rook over on g1. Do you see it now? Regardless, the best way of addressing this problem is to use backward induction. That is, think about where the end game of this particular interaction lies, and where you want to be and where you don't want to be at that point and we can use the information we glean from thinking about the end of the game to reason what are good and bad plays at the beginning of the game. For starters, if you want to win the game, then you cannot end the turn by placing the rook either on row 6 or on column L. If you were to do so, then on my subsequent turn, I can go immediately to the king's square and win the game. Thus, row 6 and column L are no-go zones, and as a consequence, I've shaded them in red. Based on that, do you see a square where if you land on it at the end of your turn, you're guaranteed a win? Think about K5. If you place the rook there, then on my turn, I only have two legal moves. That's to go up to k6, or go to the right to l5. Either way, I am placing the rook into a winning position for you. Thus, this game is not so much about getting to l6 as it is to getting to k5. If you get to k5, everything else after that is academic, and you will win the game. But that implies that landing on any of the remaining squares in row 5 or column K are automatic losses. If you place the rook there, then I can move the rook to K5 and lock you into that bad position that we just discussed. Based on that, do you see another winning square? Think about J4. If you land the rook on J4, I only have four legal moves, j5, j6, k4, and l4. Two of those lose me the game immediately. The other two allow you to place the rook onto k5, which as we saw just a moment ago, wins you the game. Either way, I'm locked out if you have placed the rook onto j4. Perhaps you see the pattern that's forming. Any other square in row 4 or column J is a losing square. If you place the rook onto it on your turn, then I would be able to move the rook to J4 and secure the victory. But that means placing the rook onto I3 is a winning strategy. 
if you were to do that, the only moves I have available to me will either cause me to lose the game directly or indirectly. That necessitates that you avoid landing the Rook into any other space on row 3 or column I. That, in turn, makes h2 a winning square. If you were to land the Rook onto h2, every space after that that I can play onto either loses me the game directly or indirectly. In turn, all remaining squares in row 2 are losing squares, as is h1. But this gives us the solution. Moving the rook to g1 is a winning strategy. If you place it there, every square above it or to the right of it is shaded red. As a result, there are no spaces that I can go to and win the game from there. And hence we have found your winning strategy. On the first move of the game, you take the rook to g1. From there, you focus on the diagonal that forms between g1 and the location of the king. No matter what move I take, you will always be able to bring the rook back to that diagonal. And eventually, that means you will capture the king. For example, if I start by moving the rook to h1, you are going to go the same distance in the opposite direction and move the rook to h2. If I take the rook to j2, then you respond by moving it up to j4. If I follow that by bringing the rook to j5, you move it over to k5, and now clearly no matter what I do, for example if I go up to k6, I'm going to lose the game and you will be able to capture the king. I mentioned earlier that this is a game of Nim in disguise. Let me finish by explaining why that's the case. This game has two resources, the number of columns and the number of rows. There are five total rows the rook can move to, the one that it's currently on doesn't count, and 11 total columns. When we have run out of those resources, then a player has arrived at the king and has won the game. What that means is that this chessboard is just a fancy way of visualizing removing items from piles. And that's exactly what Nim is. The reason that moving to g1 is the winning strategy is because it makes the piles remaining even. There are five rows you can travel to, and five columns that you can travel to. Consequently, from here you just mimic your opponent's strategy, taking an equal amount from the opposite pile. That type of strategy stealing ensures that there will always be something for you to take, until you get to the king and win the game. Did you figure this one out? Let me know in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, please like, share, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Take care.